So this video covers environments and sedimentary processes operating in alluvial fan settings. Alluvial fans are really important terrestrial depositional settings, not only on Earth, even on other planets, and they're especially found in areas where accommodation space is created rapidly. So far you've learned about sediment transport in flowing water, so this video will also introduce another important class of sediment transport processes, something called the sediment gravity flow. You'll be somewhat familiar with rivers by this point, so how do alluvial fans differ from rivers? Well, first, they form in a really different slope. It's a clear break in slope with rivers having very gentle slopes. They're basically nearly flat, so slopes less than, say, half a degree or often even less than that. Alluvial fans occur on somewhat steeper slopes, often around a few degrees to maybe even 10 or 15 degrees angle. Because of the steeper gradient of alluvial fans, there are different processes responsible for transporting and depositing sediment. Although the deposits are often coarse grained like some rivers, they have distinctive textures that separate them from braided river or other fluvial sediments. Alluvial fans, especially smaller and steeper ones, and really a large proportion of the alluvial fan deposits in the sedimentary record, are constructed primarily by the deposits of something called a debris flow. These fans originate at a point source and they develop a radiating fan or cone shape by the shifting of the active lobe or location of sediment deposition. The debris flows themselves often produce lobe-shaped deposits, kind of blobs of sediment, which is a consequence of their flow behavior. And so we'll spend most of the time in this video talking about that flow behavior and how it affects the deposits that we see. So debris flows, sometimes called mud flows or cohesive debris flows, are an example of something called a sediment gravity flow. Sediment gravity flows are mixtures of water and sediment that move because of gravity, not because of the flowing water itself. In rivers, the water is responsible for moving the sediment. But in sediment gravity flows, the water and the sediment move together as a package with gravity as the driving force. So there are four major types of sediment gravity flows, and we'll cover the other ones later on when discussing different sedimentary environments. Um, but today we'll focus on debris flows. So the four types are differentiated on the basis of rheology, another word for the behavior of the flow, and the sediment support mechanism. So debris flows are defined by having a laminar rheology and by having matrix strength as the main sediment support mechanism. Rheology is a term describing the deformation or flow of a material under a given shear stress. So imagine a fluid like water confined in a thin layer between two solid plates, like in the diagram in the lower right. If the top plate moves to the side in a shearing motion, like it slides, the friction at the contact with the fluid will drag that fluid along, while well, the fluid that's next to the stationary plate on the bottom won't move. This creates a velocity gradient, or du dy in the graph, that is analogous to the boundary layer on the bottom of a river, which you've heard about before. The velocity gradient can be thought of as a strain rate, where strain rate is just the amount of deformation per time. So the size of the velocity gradient for a given shear stress or movement of the plate is governed by the viscosity of the fluid, the symbol mu. Fluids with higher viscosity, like honey or molasses, will deform very little for a given shear stress. But low viscosity fluids, like water, will deform or will flow a lot for that same shear stress. Water is a Newtonian fluid because its viscosity is the same at any value of shear stress and because it starts to flow at the moment shear stress is first applied. So these constants can be shown graphically by plotting shear stress against strain rate with the slope being the vis viscosity of the fluid. So the red slope, slope here would be a Newtonian fluid where its slope is the, the, uh, the viscosity of that, that material. Debris flows instead have a plastic rheology, which means they have something called a yield strength. In contrast to water or other Newtonian fluids that start to flow as soon as, as stress is applied, Plastics with a yield strength won't flow or deform until a critical shear stress has been reached. That critical shear stress, the, the y-intercept here, occurs when it exceeds the yield strength. 
So debris flows also have a constant viscosity. The slope is, is, is constant here, as long as the composition, the sediment concentration and, and materials and, and so forth remain constant. So we're not going to discuss non-Newtonian pseudoplastics or dilatant fluids here, the other two lines, but they're ones where the viscosity, the slope, changes depending on the shear stress. So the plastic rheology of a debris flow has very important implications for the resulting sediment deposits, which is what we'll focus on next. So when the sediment water mixture flows over the ground, there is friction between the moving flow and the non-moving or stable ground. There's also friction with the overlying air, but to a lesser degree. So the friction at the base and the top creates shear stress, especially at the base and to a lesser extent at the top. And if that shear stress exceeds the yield strength of the, flu of the material, the mixture will flow and will deform internally, which allows the sediment grains to move relative to each other, to sort, to, to, to hit each other, and to orient themselves. The flow will be laminar because the high sediment concentration gives the flow high viscosity, and higher viscosity will reduce the turbulence. In the center of the flow, shear stress is low, and if it's lower than the yield strength, the central part of the flow will be a solid plug that will be carried by the underlying flow, but that won't deform or flow itself internally. So that means that the sediment grains in that part are frozen in place. They can't sink, they can't reorient, they can't interact. So as the slope becomes gentler, the driving force of gravity will decrease and the flow will slow down. And at some critical slope, the shear stress will drop below the yield strength and the flow will abruptly stop and freeze in place. Because it freezes abruptly, the sediment grains carried within the flow will not be able to settle to the bottom. They're, they can't sort themselves or orient themselves or reorient themselves. So the freezing of a debris flow as it stops explains how larger boulders can be trapped within the middle or even the top of the flow. But how can such large grains be carried in the first place? Well, to understand that, we'll consider the forces acting on a grain within a debris flow. So the force of gravity is the one that's going to try to make the particles sink. But there are two forces that try to hold the grain up in the flow. Buoyancy, which is a function largely of the density of the fluid matrix, and matrix strength. So let's discuss each of these in a little more detail. So buoyancy occurs because the fluid around the particle partially supports the weight of the particle and partially counteracts gravity. And this is much more important in a debris flow than it is in water because the density of the flow can be much, much higher, even as high as two grams per cubic centimeter compared to water, which is only one. And that's due to the high sediment concentration. So that's really important. But even as opposed to a pure fluid, a sediment fluid mixture has additional buoyancy contribution from the sediment itself. And this is a bit more complicated. But the weight of the overlying sediment and coarse grains plus the water will increase towards the bottom of the flow. And so that creates a pressure gradient from lower pressure at the top to higher pressure at the base. And that pressure gradient leads to an upward force on the particles. Basically, particles are trying to move upwards to equilibrate or to flatten this pressure gradient. So that's the two components of buoyancy here. The fact that the flow itself is fairly dense and the fact that there is a, a, a pressure gradient that wants to push things towards the top. It's an, even an, an additional thing here, and that's matrix strength. So matrix strength is the primary sediment support mechanism in debris flows. And this is related to the yield strength of the flow. And debris flows can have very, very, very large yield strengths, even to the point where the weight of a large boulder doesn't create enough shear stress to sink through the sediment water matrix. So why do debris flows have high yield strengths? Well, it's largely related to the mud or the clay content of the matrix. And clay minerals that are supported in the sediment water mixture can form a strong network because of electrostatic or atomic forces, even when there's really only a small amount of clay. So debris flows can have substantial matrix strength, even with only a couple percent clay. Um, so this is really the key difference between debris flows and some other types of sediment gravity flows that we're gonna see later on. So debris flows are really important on alluvial fans and flowing water isn't so important um, in terms of sediment transport on, on, on many alluvial fans, but on larger and flatter or lower gradient fans, there can be more deposits from what are called hyper-concentrated flows, either as 
that are braided channels or as something called sheet flow. Sheet flow or sheet flood is when water flows as sort of thinner sheets over the fan surface, unconfined, so it's not in a channel. So hyperconcentrated fl hyper flows are not sediment gravity flows. They are more like a river. They're flowing water that moves sediments, although typically as a, as a sheet and not as a channel. As hyperconcentrated flows are from moving water, they share many similarities with the braided river deposits that you've already learned about. The flow is turbulent, not laminar like in a debris flow, and the sediment is moved by water, so that influences the grain orientation, the distribution of grains, the bed contacts, and things like that. So the primary difference between sheet flow and rivers is that hyperconcentrated flows typically lack bars, downstream accretion, and, and often they don't even have dunes, although they can. Um, features like that, dunes and bars that you find in braided river channels, are typically not found in hyperconcentrated sheet flow on alluvial fans. Just to wrap up, the plastic rheology, the fact that, they, that these flows move as a solid plug and freeze in place, and the sediment support by matrix strength really influence the nature of debris flow and therefore alluvial fan deposits. So in class, we'll spend a fair amount of time considering how alluvial fan deposits differ from fluvial conglomerates, especially how those differences arise from the rheology and the sediment support mechanism of debris flows.